Okay, yeah, everyone. So let's continue. Uh, we would have talked this morning uh, and see what exciting things happen next. Uh, um, so we have just had a quick look at this very brief extract from one of the sutras called the uh, Dangerous for the Future. Mm. And now I'm going to have a very quick look at this other sutta here called the Delightful Discourse, the Pasadika Sutta. Mm. And uh, just again, this is in a sense just by way of background, if you like, yeah. and then we can start to get into the real gradual training very shortly after that. Yeah. So, this is how it goes. Uh, this is just a small extract from a very long suit, actually. Yeah. It was Uddhaka Ramaputta who used to say, He sees but does not see. What is it that seeing one does not see? You can see the blade of a well-sharpened razor, but not its edge. That is what he meant by saying he sees, but does not see. He spoke in reference to a low, vulgar, worldly, ignoble thing of no spiritual significance. A mere razor. So, um, uh, here we have this fellow called Uddhaka Ramaputta, and he, you may, some of you may recognize him. He was one of the Buddha's first teachings. Uh, yeah, the Buddha had uh, two teachers before he set out on his own. One was called Alara Kalama, the one, other one was called Uddhaka Ramaputta. <coughs> so they were obviously fairly well known ascetics at this time in ancient India. Uh, the Buddha to be went to them uh, and other peoples would have gone to them to seek spiritual advice. Uh, so these were like the sages in contemporary Indian society at that time. And they pop up in a few places in the suttas. Uh, the kind of uh, interesting characters in that sense, obviously fairly well known. Uh, and uh, as spiritual teachers, he has this saying, it's almost like a little bit of a koan, isn't it? The Zen koan, you see but you don't see. Uh, maybe this is the origin of Zen, I'm not sure, but uh, actually, actually it came a long time after that, of course. Uh, but uh, it has a kind of slightly koan like uh, sense to it. Uh, and you see a well sharpened razor, but not its edge. Yeah, you can see what he is talking about there, because the edge is so sharp, it just becomes invisible uh, eventually, at the very tip of it. Uh. And uh, he was speaking to reference to a low, vulgar, and this shows that the word vulgar is not really appropriate in this context. It sounds strange, yeah? How can a razor be called vulgar? This is not how you, we normally use the word vulgar in the current, uh, the current time. Vulgar means something that is slightly coarse, perhaps, or something like that. Uh. Uh, what it means is common or ordinary, yeah, an ordinary thing, a common thing, yeah, that is what it's referring to. Uh, and this is quite significant because in other places you will see the Buddha calling other things using the same word. Uh, the word in Pali, Pali is gammo, and gammo means literally of the village. Uh, in other words, referring to ordinary people, uh, ordinary things. Uh, so sensual pleasures are also gammo, uh, yeah, sensual pleasures are like ordinary, they are common, they are the common happiness in the world, if you like. Yeah. So, uh, uh, that is what he says. And how then does the Buddha rephrase this to give it more spiritual significance? This is what we have next then. Uh, if one were to use that expression properly, uh, he sees but does not see, uh, it would be like this. Uh, what he sees is a holy life, a holy way of life. This is the Brahmacharya, which is fully successful and perfect, with nothing lacking and nothing superfluous, when proclaimed in the perfection of its purity. If we were to deduct anything from it, thinking in this way it will be pure, he does not say it. And if we were to add anything to it, thinking in this way it will be more complete, then he does not see that either. That is the meaning of the saying, he sees but does not see. Therefore, Chanda, if anyone were to refer to any holy way of life as being fully and uh, successful and perfect, it is this holy life that uh, they would be describing. Yeah. And here again, the Buddha is coming towards the end of his life, uh, and he's kind of taking a, a bird's eye view of the Dhamma and the teaching that he's given, uh, and he's kind of making these proclamations about the Dhamma, about it, you know, giving a kind of a, a summary of how it works and how you should be careful to preserve it in the right way. Uh, so it's completely successful and perfect. Uh, um, 
these Pali words mean something like complete, yeah, complete really, that's really what it means, it's a complete holy life. In other words, the idea which comes just afterwards, nothing is missing. This is kind of the idea behind this. Nothing lacking and nothing superfluous. Well proclaimed in the perfection of his purity. It's a bit of poetic license there, but it's basically what it means. And this is very interesting. We're already right there. That little saying there is actually very, has a lot of significance to it. Nothing lacking, nothing superfluous. Well, let's take the superfluous part first. Yeah, what, what does this mean? Well, what it means, of course, is that when you read about the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, when you read about the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, the 37 Aids to Awakening, and yeah, we'll have a look at those in a second. Uh, when you read about anything in the Dhamma, it's not as if you can just check out a few bits and say, yeah, I don't like that part, I'm just going to practice the rest of it. Uh, yeah? and, and it may be that you don't like it, but sometimes the point is that whether we like it or not, it may still be required for uh, the fulfillment of the path. Oh, it is so hard, you know, the samadhi, oh, too difficult, yeah, I don't want to do that. Uh, but actually, samadhi, the four jhanas, they are right there at the very end of the path. But you can't just throw it out and think that you still have uh, a full spiritual life. And yeah, you haven't. You've taken away an essential aspect of it. Nothing is superfluous. Uh, if it is in there, it has meaning. It is, it, it is required. Uh, the same thing with right here. Some people say, yeah, rebirth, you know, it's not kind of modern, you know, how can anyone believe in rebirth? This is kind of a superstition they had two and a half thousand years ago. But again, it is right there in right here. Okay, maybe we have it wrong in the present day. Maybe we are the ones that got it wrong. Maybe they got it right. You know, it's important to be a bit humble about this thing and not be too kind of uh, conceited about our present state of knowledge. So because sometimes, okay, there's a lot of good things to say about you know, our present state of knowledge, of course, uh, but it's certainly not complete. Everybody agrees about that. Uh, so maybe there's more to it that I'm not aware of. Uh. So remember that if the Buddha has put it in there, it's not just kind of random. We add a few bits, that, bits and bobs that are not really required. Yeah, but Actually, if it is there, it has a meaning. And this is actually so, uh, such an important thing to remember. Uh. If you practice the sevenfold noble eightfold, the sevenfold can't be called noble anymore, the sevenfold path, uh, it's not going to lead to awakening. It's the eightfold path that is to awakening. All eight factors are important. They all have to be conjoined uh, together. And then the practice leads uh, to the very end of suffering and to the highest happiness and all of these kind of things. Uh. So please keep that in mind because these are kind of broad issues that inform you how to read the suttas, yeah, what matters, how to deal with these things. Uh. This is why I kind of bring them out now at the very beginning to give us that kind of background, the bird's eye view, which kind of informs us for the rest of the uh, retreat. Uh, and there's nothing lacking. This is the other part of this. Again, a very important part. Uh, yeah, the Buddha has not proclaimed a spiritual life, a brahmacharya, that is only partial. Uh, all the pieces, all the bits that are required for fulfilling the path are there. Yeah, it's not as if you have to add kind of your own ideas or anything like that. Uh, and again, this is very significant uh, because what it means is that as soon as we step out of those things and we think, yeah, you know, we need to kind of purify it more, we need to create an Abhidhamma philosophy that encompasses all the Buddha's teachings, that, that fills all the gaps that haven't been filled, and, yeah, and all these kind of things. Actually, normally what happens when you do that, you move away from the teaching uh, because nothing is lacking, uh, not actually adding anything that is useful. Uh, what you do is moving away from what is the, sim the relative simplicity and, re and directness of the earliest expression of these teachings, uh, which <laughs> come directly from the Buddha himself. Uh. So remember that every time we kind of start, you know, adding things and saying things, usually we actually move away from the original thing. Yeah? And this is one of the reasons why I, you know, I would not, I don't really recommend people to read the Abhidhamma. I don't recommend people to read too much apart from the suttas themselves, unless you, you know, you have, uh, you know, some spare time and you want to inform yourself what these things are about. That's okay, of course, but don't take that as your uh, kind of the foundation for, for how to uh, pursue the practice of the path, etc. So very, very interesting, yeah, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so, uh, uh, if you were to deduct anything uh, uh, in this way, it will be more pure. You don't see that. Yeah, you can't find anything that you can deduct to make it more pure. 
And if you were to add anything thinking in this way, it would be more complete. Again, you don't see that. You don't see anything that needs to be added. That is how you understand the Dhamma fully here. And uh, then, uh, uh, it did that, of course, that holy life, that Brahmacharya, that spiritual path, basically, uh, that has been proclaimed by the Buddha, is, has those qualities. Uh, and nothing more, nothing needs to be added, nothing needs to be deducted. Uh. So, uh, what is this particular path? Uh, and this is the next thing that comes up here. Uh. Therefore, Chunda, all you to whom I have taught this truth that, have, that I have realized by super knowledge uh, should come together and recite them, setting meaning beside meaning uh, and expression beside expression. Uh, without dissension, in order that this holy life may continue and be established for a long time, uh, for the benefit, the, uh, benefit, profit and happiness of devas and humans. So, uh, of course, the uh, interesting thing here, uh, straight away, is the idea that these truths that I have realized by my own, it says here, super knowledge, this is abhinya, it basically means insight. Yeah, one of these words that refers to insight. And, um, and that, of course, is very significant. The Buddha's teachings are not speculative. It is something that comes through direct access to uh, direct insight into the reality. And that comes this nice little thing here, which shows you how the Buddha expects the Sangha to uh, keep the Dhamma alive for the future. Yeah, you should come together, recite them together, yeah. and of course, if you can imagine, if you have a large group of people coming together reciting these teachings, uh, because in the early days they were committed to memory, yeah. and because you're committed to memory, there's always a chance that you will get a few things wrong. Yeah, yeah memory is inherently unreliable, we all know that. Yeah. But of course, if you have a large number of people coming together, you correct those people who have uh, misremembered it, yeah? And because of that, you actually, it enables you then to uh, to um, uh, keep these teachings alive for a much longer period as a consequence. Uh, and one of the reasons why the suttas often seem so repetitive, uh, yeah, why you often have suttas that have, where there's so much, so many synonyms used all the time, and to express the same thing is expressed <coughs> in kind of five different ways. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because the Buddha realized, and we'll see that in a second, he realized at the very beginning that these teachings, uh, they will have to be orally recited for a long period into the future, precisely to be for the benefit of people in the future. So he gave these teachings in a way that are optimized for oral recitation. They may not optimized, but you know what I mean. It's kind of, it is done so that the oral recitation uh, becomes easy. Yeah. And uh, what is astonishing uh, is that uh, uh, prior to Buddhism, uh, the uh, teachings, the main stream teachings in India at that time were, of course, the Brahmanical teachings. Uh, the Brahmanical teachings are the precursors to modern day Hinduism. Uh, yeah, and some of those teachings, uh, uh, two and a half thousand years ago, have already had existed for over a thousand years before that. Uh, things like the Rig Veda, which is the most ancient part of the Brahmanical teachings. Uh, and it is known today by you know looking at the uh, various manuscripts and the way that this has been recited, uh, we know that those teachings were kept almost verbatim over centuries after century because the Bra Brahmins at that time uh, they were so skilled. The method they used for uh, retaining these things in memory was so well developed uh, that they knew how to actually keep these things almost verbatim uh, over vast uh, timescales. Uh, and so India had a kind of a science of recitation, the science of oral memorization already existed in India at that time. And the Buddha actually used many of the existing techniques, brought us into the Dhamma, applied them to the Dhamma so that the Dhamma also could be kept alive for a long time into the future. People often wonder how is it possible to remember all these teachings, yeah, and to, and to make sure there's no, no faults in them over long periods of time. Well, the reason is because uh, this was a science that was already highly developed in India at that time. Uh, that is the main reason. Uh, and um, if you're interested in this kind of topic, then uh, there is a, a, a book called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text, uh, which uh, was written by uh, Adha Sujato and myself. Uh, and it has some of the details in there about how the similarities between the Brahmanical text and the, and the suttas, how they actually 
uh, are very, in many ways, similar to each other uh, in terms of structure, in terms of making it easy to memorize for future generations. So, yeah, so for this reason, memory can often be quite accurate. Yeah, it can be quite, uh, uh, it can actually keep these things alive for a long time. Uh, and uh, if you know a little bit about the history of Buddhism, uh, then uh, basically the uh, various schools of Buddhism, or rather maybe the Sangha, uh, started to drift apart around the time of Ashoka. Yeah, we know that Ashoka, he had missionaries and he sent the Sangha to various parts of India. And some of, uh, parts of the Sangha, they went to the north, to Kashmir, Gandhara, what is now Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and other parts, of course, went to Sri Lanka. Yeah, those of you who have a Sri Lankan background, you know that Mahinda went to Sri Lanka together with his sister and Sangamitta, and they both came to Sri Lanka and they brought the Dhamma to Sri Lanka. And that also happened at the time of Ashoka. So the Sangha started spreading out from Sri Lanka all the way up to Afghanistan. How far is that? It's about 3,000 kilometers. Yeah, okay, today 3,000 kilometers is nothing. Yeah, you can fly that in a few hours. You come from Perth in Australia, it's no big problem. You come to London very quickly, except for getting a bit of jet lag, that's the only thing. Yeah. But uh, in the, those days, you would travel 3,000 kilometers, uh, unless you had psychic powers and you could fly through the air, which was not that common, even though you may think everybody had that. Actually, it wasn't really the case. Uh, not that many had those psychic powers. Uh, so the way you had to do it, either you had to walk, uh, or you had to use like an ox cart. Uh, yeah, that's, those were basically your choices. Uh, so ox cart or walking, uh, yeah, takes a few days to go from Sri Lanka to uh, Afghanistan, 3,000 kilometers. It takes a few months, usually, uh, to do that. Uh, so because of that, uh, and because of this large geographical spread, uh, it meant that the Buddhist teaching started to develop slightly differently in those different geographical areas. Uh, and this is one of the causes for the origin of the different schools of Buddhism. So in the north of India, you had the Sarvastivadas, the Dharmaguptaka especially, and in the south of India, you had, or in Sri Lanka, uh, you had uh, the Theravadans uh, uh, establishing themselves in the Mahavihara in Anuradhapura. Uh, and that's where kind of they, they all kind of got established and started out. So you had vast differences. But what is significant about this, even though those distances were so large, and even though the uh, suttas were transmitted orally, uh, yeah, if you compare those suttas that were transmitted through, through the Sarvastivadans, uh, and the, exactly the same suit as transmitted to the Theravans, uh, if you compare them, even though they were all transmitted for you know several hundred years, so far apart, uh, they are almost exactly the same to the present day. Yeah, they have the main content. There are certain changes in you know word here, word there. Sometimes the passage has maybe been left out or missed, uh, but basically it is exactly the same. Uh, and it's kind of when you read it, it's almost hard to fathom. Uh, it's, you know, one sutta I was talking about yesterday, the sutta on uh, dependent liberation, uh, which talks about how you start off with virtue, then you have non-regret, uh, then you have uh, a gladness or joy in the mind, then you have the rapture, the uh, stillness, the, the happiness, and the samadhi. And this is a very common sutta found throughout the Pali Canon in many different places. Uh, that sutta was also transmitted in the Sarvastivad tradition. Uh, then translated into Chinese, and now it has been translated back from Chinese into English. And, yeah? and of course, we have the Pali also in English now translated into English. And if you put them side by side, uh, you're hard put to tell which one is from the Chinese and which one is from the Pali because they are so similar. Yeah? It's almost exactly the same. Uh, and they have been apart for 2,300 years, transmitted separately. Yeah? Isn't that kind of astonishing? Yeah? It's almost Incredible, nothing. It's almost like the laws of impermanence have been kind of confounded. Yeah, permanent. These circles are permanent. That's almost what it feels like. Of course, they're not, but it's almost to that point where you kind of can't, can't barely believe that it's actually true. And of course, what that means, and this is one of those uh, powerful arguments to say that we still are in possession of the word of the Buddha, because if we are, have been able to keep them like this for 2,300 years, uh, Time of Ashoka was maybe 150 years after the Buddha, yeah, roughly. It depends on when we uh, when we place the Buddha in time. If we're able to keep them for 2,300 years, then surely they were able to keep them intact for the 150 years before that. Uh, 
The whole tradition is very conservative. And why? Because, of course, uh, they were desperate to keep the word of the Buddha in love. This was the main function of this, one of the main functions of the Sangha was to do precisely that. Uh. So, you know, when people say that we don't know what the Buddha taught, uh, I think it's complete nonsense. We do know what the Buddha taught. And, you, and this is uh, at least in the kind of the main teachings. Yeah? It may be in certain uh, tiny details, we may not know that, but in terms of the main teachings, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, uh, basically all the things that matter, we know exactly what the Buddha taught two and a half thousand years ago. Right? So, and this is how it happened. This is how they were able to do that, by reciting these things uh, yeah, together, setting meaning beside meaning, expression beside expression. Uh, and one of the things about the Buddha's teachings is that both the meaning and the expression matter. Uh, the Buddha, precisely because of what he said before, there's nothing superfluous, nothing lacking. Uh, every word kind of matters. Uh, and this is sort of exciting because when you read the sutras, you look at them, yeah, it's like you are mining the mining the meaning in a sense, uh, looking at it, all the little words that are there and bring it all together, yeah, and you can try to draw out the meaning. Everything matters. Uh, yeah, it's actually it's actually quite interesting when you really look at the sutras in that way. Yeah. So the expression matters. You are very careful with that, and of course the meaning. The meaning is then about the interpretation of the expression. How do we interpret the word of the Buddha? <coughs> And of course, that is uh, often uh, quite uh, fraught and, and difficult, and, and uh, not, not difficult necessarily, but it's always going to be some degree of difference in how we interpret these things. Uh, and uh, that is where it, it gets uh, uh, can, can get tricky here. But of course, the idea here is then to uh, supply your understanding of the suttas through your own, with your practice and with your own understanding, and then gradually uncover the meaning. And ideally also have someone you feel you can trust uh, who can kind of you know give you a summary or give you an idea of what these teachings are uh, to kind of help you at least in the beginning until you kind of get your own footing and you kind of know what you uh, you know how to how to look at these things. But both interpretation and expression matter in uh, in how we deal with this sutta. So uh, and uh, yes. So then, without dissension, yeah, the idea is to come to agreement on what they mean, uh, uh, in order that this holy life may continue and be established for a long time for the profit and happiness uh, of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, profit and happiness of devas and humans. So this is the purpose of the Dhamma, yeah, to be for the happiness of people, uh, uh, and that is the kind of the whole thing. What this is about. Uh, and uh, it continue and be established for a long time. So this is where I say that the Buddha already had this vision uh, of setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. And once the uh, wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion, it has a certain momentum to it. That, yeah, the wheel keeps rolling for a certain time until it then falls over and the Dhamma comes to an end. Uh, and this is what the Buddha realized. That, yeah, once you do this, once you get this thing started. Uh, when somebody comprehends the Dhamma through their own insight uh, and they pass it on to the next generation and on and on it goes, this is what it means to roll out the wheel of the Dhamma, then it will keep going in the world through the mere power of the realization of these teachings carried on from generation to generation. Uh, so this is the long, long term. And this is kind of what is so marvelous when you read the suttas. Very often you feel like the Buddha is talking to me. Yeah, have you had that feeling? Well, I recognize this. And it's so kind of often very basic and simple psychological truths. Uh, and this feeling that the Buddha is using a universal language uh, that is beyond culture and beyond uh, uh, kind of historical situations, beyond that, uh, and speaks directly to the human heart. Of course, the human heart is basically the same wherever you go. Uh, yeah, regardless of your background, regardless of your culture, regardless of the time period. Uh, the thing is, it, our inner life is, you know, we have basically the same problems in the world. Uh, we have the same kind of search of happiness, of each one of us. Uh, so for that, uh, the suttas can be expressed in a universal way, which basically is true for everyone. Uh, and that's why, even now, they are so, it's so marvelous to be able to read, read these things. Uh. So, uh, so you teach these things out of compassion for the world, the profit and happiness of devas and humans. Uh, Kind of interesting is that the devas are also included in it. The Buddha didn't just teach for human beings, uh, he also taught for other beings as well. Uh. 
So, uh, so sometimes people say, oh, you know, in my next life I want to be reborn as a human, because if you get reborn as a deva, then, you know, that's it, you had it. All you do is enjoy yourself, you can't practice the Dharma. But actually the Buddha says that the, the Dharma is also for the devas, so even devas benefit from this. So, so maybe being reborn as a deva is not so bad after all, though. What do you reckon? Eh? That's what I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and what are these things that we should recite together? Yeah, this is where we get down to the nitty gritty. What is this Dhamma that should be recited together? Yeah? And there are as follows. Uh, the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, uh, the four roads to power, mm-hmm. the five spiritual faculties, uh, the five mental powers, the seven factors of awakening, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, these are the things you should recite together. And this collection of the uh, factors that you see here, uh, if you add them all up, it comes to 37. Uh, yeah, these are known in the later Buddhism as the 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas. Uh, we're talking about the qualities on the side of awakening, the qualities that aid awakening. Uh, so these are the things that we should uh, memorize. This is the essence of the Dhamma. This is what the Dhamma is all about. Now, if you look at those thir- 37 factors, uh, you will see that they are very practical. They are all about the path, all about the practice. Uh, and so when the Buddha teaches us, the main thing that the Buddha is focused on uh, is the practice. What do we need to do to get to the uh, end of this path? Uh, the focus is not on theoretical things, but in precisely how we should apply ourselves. Uh, to be able to get to uh, uh, get to this path, uh, uh, get to get the goals or the purposes of the of, uh, that the Buddha has in mind. Uh, yeah, so very practical teachings. Uh, uh, so what? How do we deal with these thirty-seven? What do they actually mean? How can they kind of be summarized? And actually, if you look at these things, it's actually quite simple to remember these things, uh, because the first one, the first foundation, the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, well. First of all, foundations of mindfulness is, in my opinion, not really adequate translation because uh, the idea of foundation of mindfulness gives the sense that these are the basis uh, upon which mindfulness arises. Yeah, this is kind of the idea you get. It's a foundation for mindfulness, but actually, that's not what these things are. <coughs> to be able to practice satipatthana, and this is uh, the Pali word behind this, uh, to be able to do that, you have to have mindfulness already established. Uh, so it's not so much about how to give rise to mindfulness, it is how to apply the mindfulness once it has been established. Yes, and then you increase mindfulness even more, sure, that's, that is certainly true, but you have to have a minimum degree of mindfulness already established to be able to uh, uh, practice these things. So I think a better translation would be something like the four applications of mindfulness, yeah, or even the four focuses of mindfulness, how we apply it. Um, Venerable Bikki Bodhi, he tries to have the four establishments of mindfulness, which is also kind of okay, eh? but my preference is perhaps the four applications of mindfulness. Eh? So this is the first thing. Now, of course, these <coughs> four applications of mindfulness, eh, they are nothing other than uh, the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Eh? Yeah? So what the Buddha does, he has takes out certain of those factors eh, and then kind of uh, uh, talks about them separately to, to sort of uh, emphasize them, I suppose, and to kind of give them extra extra weight, if you wish. Four right efforts, yeah, exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's, all, it's the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's already in there. Yeah. So you kind of substitute it back into the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah. So it kind of fits in with that. Uh, the four roads to power, uh, uh, four iti padas. Uh, uh, iti means like spiritual power. Uh, yeah, like it... Uh, uh, it uh, specifically refers to samadhi and how to use samadhi to gain extra insights and knowledges. Uh, and pardon is like step or foot. Yeah? So the four steps to power, the four factors of uh, spiritual power, if you like, is what this actually refers to. Uh, and these things are all about samadhi practice. Uh, how, to, how to build up samadhi, how to apply using uh, various techniques, how to build up your samadhi faculty. Uh, so that kind of slots in with the last factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, the uh, Samad Samadhi, uh, it fits in there. So you can see how all of this kind of contracts together. 
the five spiritual faculties and the five mental powers. Uh, this is a very common set found throughout the suttas. Uh, these are uh, the uh, spiritual facu faculty of confidence or faith at the beginning. Uh, from that faith arises the energy, uh, the desire to apply yourself because you think, wow, this is good stuff, so you apply yourself. Uh, then because you apply yourself, uh, uh, the mindfulness arises, then comes the samadhi, then comes the wisdom as a consequence of that. Uh, these are the five spiritual faculties. Uh, and the five spiritual powers are exactly the same. Uh, there's no difference between the five faculties uh, and the five powers. Uh, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, why is that the case? I'm not going to get into that, but I, I don't actually know 100% why it is the case, to be honest with you. But uh, a guess would be that uh, the Buddha used maybe one terminology early on and a different terminology later, because maybe he found another terminology, terminology to be better or something. Yeah. And for that reason, yeah, they have, you ended up with ten rather than five factors. Uh, but basically, they are the same thing. Yeah. And these things are what they are. Yeah. They are factors that tend to arise once you become an Arya. Once you are a noble person uh, and you have complete insight into the Dhamma, because the noble ethical path then becomes part of you. Uh, yeah. This is one of the things about the noble ethical path. Once you see the Four Noble Truths, uh, uh, they become an aspect of who you are. They become part of your psychology. The path is lodged in your mind. Bang! Yeah, and there it is. Uh, and you can't. You know, you have to practice the path after that. You have no choice anymore. So, uh, that's, is that scary? Actually, it's very nice because it's like automatic. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You just kind of get into the jhanas and all these things that happen automatically. So actually, very good. Uh, but uh, it may. Yeah, so we have to get get these things right. So they are a, a particular way, a level of looking at the noble and full path, the way it looks once you are an area, once you are a noble one who has seen these things. That is what these things express. So then we have the seven factors of awakening. Yeah, yeah? Uh, I prefer awakening to enlightenment. But I think yeah, awakening to me is more meaningful and it makes sense also from the way the suttas talk about this. Uh, as the light going on, being able to see things, yeah, before you're walking around in darkness, uh, now you see what is going on. It's more like an awakening. Enlightenment in English has a lot of baggage, and I, I don't really like that word so much. Uh, so seven factors of awakening, what are they? And we can talk about those more later on if you like, but essentially they start off with the sati sambhodanga, the factor of, of mindfulness factor of awakening. Uh, and then I go through a sequence of factors ending up with the samadhi and upeka sambhodanga. You know, the factor of awakening that is samadhi, four jhanas of course, and upeka, which is the highest expression of the four jhanas in the fourth jhana itself. So this last one is really just an expansion of the last two factors of the noble eightfold path. Yeah, so you can see what I'm, what I'm doing here, is I'm trying to kind of make, I, I thought, I don't know if, what, if you're all able to remember 37 factors, uh, it's a lot to remember, yeah? Especially in this day and age, where you got the infinite, as it was, you can just whack it in there, say 37 factors, or where can you get it straight away? But it's good to be able to remember these things, and 37 is a lot to remember. Yeah? It's difficult, to, difficult enough to remember one thing, and yeah, it's hard enough. And, uh, you know what I mean? If, you, know, if you have to remember one thing, like, okay, I'm going to be kind, yeah? And, but in daily life, how easy is it to remember that all the time? Actually, it's pretty hard. It's before you know it, your mindfulness is lost. So we can't even remember one thing. But how are we going to be able to remember 37? Yeah, so that's why I'm trying to simplify things for you. I'm being compassionate. Yeah, this is what it's all about. So I'm reducing 37 down to 8. And this is what I've just shown you now. How those 37 factors of awakening, how they, uh, how 37 factors, aids to awakening, yeah, let me get this right, uh, how they essentially contract down to the noble and full path. Uh, that is really what they, ultimately, what, what they come down to. Uh, so uh, that makes it easier. And this uh, uh, makes it easy to remember. You don't really have to worry too much about those things. Uh, although all of these different views can be useful, uh, noble and full path is really what you have to uh, recall, try to recall. Uh, and this is why uh, the rest of this retreat is going to be to look at an expansion of the Noble Way for Path, the detailed explanation of it, uh, so you have kind of a firm foundation for how to practice this path. Uh, this is what this ultimately is about. So first of all, I contract it down to eight factors, and uh, then I expand it out again into this long thing here. 
Sounds, sounds contradictory, doesn't it? That this is how the Dhamma works. You contract it, you expand it. Uh, there's all these different angles, yeah. And, and it's almost like, yeah, I think it was my, my friend Adam Sudata, he was saying said, said that the Dhamma is like fractal geometry. I don't know if you heard about fractal geometry or, or fractals. So fractals is this recurring patterns, uh, yeah, in nature. And uh, if you take, like, uh, for example, the coastline of a country, yeah, and then you uh, you see it kind of a, a you know a picture of a country, I don't know, like the UK, yeah, you see the whole coastline all the way around it. And then you focus on a small part of that coastline and you expand it out. That small part looks a bit like the whole coastline. And you focus on that small one, they expand that one, and also looks a bit like the previous one. And you keep on focusing like that. And the Dhamma is a bit like that. And then you can expand it, contract it, and it's just different ways of expressing the same thing. It has this kind of fractal sense to it. I don't know, it's just a fancy way of, of saying that, I don't know, <laughs> of, uh, of thinking about these things, I suppose. But this, then, is what the Dharma is. So if you ever want to know uh, what the Buddha teaches, uh, yeah, you can look at it from the point of view of the Four Noble Truths, uh, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, and these are all valid ways of thinking about this. And this is what it really comes down to. Uh, this is what really matters. Uh. So, now, let us start on this noble eightfold path, the gradual training. And uh, the sutta that I'm going to have a look at it is called, called the Shorter Sutta on the Simile of the Elephant's Footprint, the Chula Hati Padopama Sutta in Pali. And uh, it is, a, in my opinion, a particularly a uh, nice, beautiful way of expressing this gradual training. And uh, it talks about this training as the Tathagata, in a sense, practicing and then seeing the Tathagata as you come towards the very end of this path, uh, seeing the footprint of the Tathagata. Yeah, and just to make this point straight away, uh, uh, that uh, when we come towards the very end of the path, uh, uh, the Buddha says that when you come to the jhanas, uh, the jhanas are called the footprint of the Tathagata, the footprint of the Buddha. Yeah, it's an extraordinarily powerful statement when you think about it. Uh, the Buddha does praise the jhanas again and again in the sutta as being very important and significant. Uh, but here he literally says that they are the footprint of the Buddha. In other words, when you come to the jhanas, uh, it's as if you know that the Buddha has been here. You know that he too would have had to practice these things. He has walked through these particular psychological states, uh, and we have to walk through the same ones. You start to become into the presence of the Buddha. Now, the Buddha now is not going to be very far away. He's kind of a few footsteps away. You're getting very, very close. And these things, these ways of looking at the Dhamma are actually very significant because very often you will find in Buddhist circles there's all kinds of discussions about samadhi. Uh, what is real samadhi? What are the real jhanas? Yeah, you have you have, you have jhana light. Yeah, you want jhana light. Everybody wants jhana light because it's easier. Yeah, but more important than whether it's light or not light is whether it's real. Yeah, that's actually what matters. Uh, so people often say, oh yeah, you know, I want the jhana light because then I can do it. Otherwise, I can't do it. Uh, that's kind of missing the point. The point is to practice the path that leads to awakening, not to kind of just get some jhanas because it's easier. That's kind of pointless. Uh, so we don't want to have jhana life for the sake of jhana, jhana. So we want to have the real deal. This is the point of this. So, and you know that when these things are called the footprint of the Tathagata, you know it's going to have to be profound. Yeah, it's not going to be jhana life. It's going to be something which actually is very close to awakening itself. Uh, this becomes kind of obvious, doesn't it? Uh, otherwise, uh, it wouldn't have, would have these kind of names. Uh, and this is something that you see throughout the suttas again and again and again. Uh, the profundity with uh, which uh, uh, these jhanas are explained through similes, through metaphors, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is one example of that. Uh, I'm just making this point. It, this doesn't mean that you know prior to the jhanas, the path is really boring and really kind of uh, has no kind of purpose or whatever. Rather, the reality is that long before you get to the jhanas, you start to, the path becomes very enjoyable. Uh, Already, you know, fairly early on, you sit down, you become peaceful, joy starts to arise in the mind, uh, and you start to feel this is incredibly significant, incredibly meaningful. Uh, and yet, you're nowhere near the jhanas yet. Uh, that is what is so amazing about this path. Yeah, you start to feel so inspired by what is happening inside of you, and still you have a long way to go to the jhanas. Uh, 
It's not something that is bad, it's actually something which is very inspiring because you start to understand the profundity of these teachings. Uh, the amount of bliss and happiness that is available if you practice these things in the right way. Uh, to me, that actually is incredibly inspiring. Uh, not something that we kind of feel bad about because, you know, it, it takes a lot of practice or whatever. Uh, so you go through these blisses, one after the other. Uh, you still haven't got there. And after a while, you wonder, I can't, if I got a brown, I don't know if I can take any more of this bliss. Yeah, just two bliss from them. Is that a problem or, or is that kind of okay? It's kind of okay, isn't it? Uh, you start to wonder whether you can, can't take any more bliss. There's something very uh, kind of remarkable and astonishing about that. Uh, so you just keep on doing this uh, and eventually you get there. But remember, in the meantime, there is so much happiness on this path, even before you get to the jhanas. Uh, and uh, this is what is so uh, kind of uh, interesting about this. Uh, Anyway, so this is why this sutta is heading. I actually started at the end of the sutta, not at the beginning, but never mind it. Uh, so this is a simile, and it's the simile of the elephant's footprint, and it's the simile, I haven't actually, uh, the simile is not actually here. It has already been spoken about by the Buddha, and it's basically the simile of someone who, uh, like the, an elephant uh, person, who kind of follow, following the elephant, yeah? And then as he follows the elephant, he sees the footprint of the elephant, uh, and then he follows after the footprint, and then eventually he kind of sees the elephant in the forest. Uh, yeah? In the same way, we also follow the elephant. We follow the Buddha, the Buddha like the elephant. In Pali, uh, the word for elephant is Naga, and Naga is also a word for the Buddha. It's also a word for dragons and serpents in Buddhism. Yeah? But we're not going to talk about that. Uh, so uh, maybe we should, it's kind of exciting to talk about dragons and serpents, but not at the right now. Uh, and uh, so and the simile here, so the simile of the path is, sim is, is like that. This is the simile for the path. You practice until you actually see the Buddha for yourself uh, in your mind's eye, because you know that this is where the Buddha must have been uh, by practicing the same way. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to give these particular teachings. Uh. So, having given the simile, this is what the Buddha has to say. And he is here talking to a Brahmin who has come to him and questioned him about these things. And he says, so too Brahmin, here a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of the world, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed teacher of gods and humans, uh, awakened and blessed. Yeah, so that, I don't know, some of you would probably recognize that. Uh, and that is the very famous passage that we recite a lot uh, in, in a traditional Buddhist country. You would recite this in Pali or a lot, uh, or in a monastery as well. We do this all the time. Uh, this is a famous, um, uh, a famous little verse that goes Itipiso Bhagava Adam Samma Sambuddha Vijja Sampano etc. And this particular verse, uh, the reason why we, we recite it a lot uh, is because it proclaims the <coughs> qualities of the Buddha. And yeah, this is what this is about. Uh, and then of course after that we then proclaim the qualities of the Dhamma and the Sangana. So this is what this does. Uh, but it not only does it proclaim the qualities of the Buddha, but it proclaims the qualities of the Buddha in the way that the Buddha himself recommends that we should remember these things. Yeah? This is how the Buddha says we should remember him. This is quite interesting. If we can remember the Buddha, these are the specific qualities that matter. And actually when you read this, and I'm going to try to draw out the meaning of this a little bit, it actually is quite interesting. Because there are certain ways that we tend to remember the Buddha which actually are completely misguided. Uh, and yet the things that we see in here are very practical things, pragmatic things uh, that have to do with uh, understanding reality in the right way, etc. And not to do with all kind of miraculous powers or whatever else there is. Uh. So this is how we should remember the Buddha. What is the significance of uh, rec recollecting and remembering the Buddha? Why would we even want to do this? Uh? And uh, the answer is uh, one of the very important thing is in meditation practice is precisely to give rise to a sense of joy, yeah? Gives rise to a sense of happiness at the very outset. And the Buddha shows you in sutta after sutta how to get that joy going. And once the joy gets going, then the process almost takes over by itself. 
And one of the ways of giving rise to joy in meditation practice is precisely to remember the qualities of the Buddha. Yeah, this is not easy, especially if you think about the Buddha in the wrong way. It's not, necess- not going to happen very easily. Yeah? But it is really worthwhile, because if you can get your mind around who the Buddha is, uh, it starts to kind of make sense. And you think, wow, I'm so lucky. I've got this teacher who has basically understood everything I want to know in my life. Uh, yeah, if you get a really good teacher in school, yeah, you go to school, you get a really good teacher who teaches you mathematics or whatever, and you are so, feel so happy because you've got a good teacher. You think back from the old days and you think, wow, this teacher was so great, and you feel so happy about that. Uh, but learning mathematics, yeah, learning mm-hmm. your multiplication table is kind of irrelevant in life compared to learning about the very meaning of life itself. Uh, and this is kind of the point about the Buddha. Here is someone who gives you the gift of the very highest. Uh, who lives his life out of compassion for everyone, uh, and he gives you that gift. And then, uh, when you think about that, yeah, in the right way, you think, wow, this actually is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, and then, when you understand that you have the kind of primary teacher of the meaning of life, uh, has kind of, you somehow, you have kind of stumble on these things, each one of us has stumbled onto that, uh, you feel so blessed, yeah, you feel so, you feel, how did this happen? I, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, but I've got these marvelous teachings, uh, and then you feel a sense of joy because of that. Uh, this is how it happens, yeah? This is the ideal way. So you have to think about the Buddha in such a way that these kind of things start to arise. Uh, one of the things about the Buddhist path, it is very much an emotional path. Uh, yeah? Or rather you can say that emotion and understanding go together. Uh, but meditation is all about emotions, it's all about happiness, it's all about bliss and these kind of things. Uh, so because of that, if we can get into that kind of emotional aspect, uh, that is when this path really starts to take off. Uh, so this is uh, one of those interesting things about, uh, about this teaching. Yeah. We don't make it too intellectual, don't make it too dry, make it really, uh, make, it, make it emotional, that's when it is really powerful. Uh. Anyway, what does all this mean? Uh? First of all, a Tathagata appears in the world. Uh. What does that mean then? Uh? It means that the Buddha arises. Yeah, it means that the Buddha comes to be. What does it mean that the Buddha arises? It means that some person then, somewhere is able to make the breakthrough and see reality as it actually is. Yeah, to see through the veil of ignorance and delusion, and to see past that, to kind of turn on the lights, to get out of the darkness. And there are some very beautiful symbolism for awakening that I hope to talk about later on. Maybe even now we'll see what happens. Uh, and that is what it means. Somebody <coughs> is actually able to do that. <coughs> how are they able to do that? What is the? How does this happen? Uh, and of course, in later Buddhism, the way this happens is through the Bodhisattva path. Yeah, you practice the Bodhisattva for four incalculable eons, etc. You know you. Uh, all this, this is what happens in later Buddhism. But actually, there is nothing about that at all in the early suttas. Uh, both Mahayana Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism is full of Bodhisattva things. Uh, and even today, if you ask certain people, they say they are Bodhisattvas. Uh, yeah, you ask certain monks, and they, or maybe nuns as well, I don't know. Uh, and they say, yeah, I'm a Bodhisattva. And I say, oh yeah, are you sure? <laughs> Actually, sure about that, because uh, the problem is that where they get that from, they get it from later tradition. It's actually not in the suttas. Uh, the Buddha doesn't say we should be bodhisattvas. Uh, he said we should practice the path to reach awakening. That's what the Buddha says. Uh, yeah. So why don't we? Shouldn't we respect that if the Buddha says that uh, and try to follow that path instead? Uh, but instead of doing that, we kind of go by what later generations have, you know, made up. Uh, and we try to make up something new, something different. Uh, but the problem with being a bodhisattva is that there is no path uh, to become to being a bodhisattva. There is no path to Buddhahood. Uh, the only path there is is the path to become an arahant. Uh, and because there is no path, you are blind. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, yeah? How do you, if you are a bodhisattva, how do you know that you're on the right path? How do you even know that you're a bodhisattva? Yeah? If you were a bodhisattva in your past life, would you know in this life that you are a bodhisattva? I can't imagine, isn't it? How, how would you know that? You can't even remember your past life. It makes it really impossible. So the Bodhisattva path is not really the answer. This is not how these things happen. This is not why Buddha arises, uh, Buddhas arise in the world. So why then do Buddhas arise in the world? If, there's not, if there is no path to get there, how does it happen? And the way it happens is that occasionally, 
the factors that are required for somebody to make the breakthrough, they all congeal and all come together so that somebody is actually able to make that breakthrough and then see reality as it actually is. So I would say the Buddha is like a natural phenomenon. Does that make sense? The Buddha is a natural phenomenon. It sounds like almost disrespectful, doesn't it? The Buddha is a natural phenomenon, like a tree or a storm or something. But uh, I think basically it is true. We are also natural phenomena. Well, each one of us, we're just natural phenomena in a certain way. Yeah. And the Buddha is a natural phenomenon because sometimes uh, all the conditions come together when someone is able to see, break through, and see things according to reality. Yeah. What are those conditions? And I can't really <coughs> uh, say exactly what they are because it is not actually mentioned anywhere in the suttas. But you can give a rough idea what those conditions might be. And you know, one of the things that you had in ancient India that was quite unique to that society, you had a samana tradition, a tradition of ascetics of people already were wandering and searching for truth, and they had and they were supported by society. Just in the same way as being a monk or a nun now, we are also supported by the wider society. It's a very beautiful thing, yeah, that society values the sp spiritual search to the point where you are willing to support people who are on that, on that journey. Isn't that very beautiful? Man? And it helps out everyone because, of course, if you support someone else, they teach you in return, yeah, and one day you go forth and you carry on that tradition. Man. And so it moves on from generation to generation. Man. That mutual support from between the uh, spiritual searches of the monastic community and those who support them is actually a very beautiful thing when you think about it in the right way. Yeah. So, uh, it, and this existed in India already at that time, the Samana tradition. Yeah. And not only was there the Samana tradition, yeah, but that tradition had already was already practicing samadhi. Yeah, they were already practicing the jhanas, uh, getting profound states of meditation, all of that. Uh, so in other words, a large part of the spiritual path was already being practiced. Uh, all the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, except for the first one, right view was the one that was lacking, all the other factors were already being practiced. Uh, yeah, so you are as close, if you like, to enlightenment, to awakening it, as you can come without that last little spark that gives you the ability to break through to reality. So these are some of those conditions that had to be present. And of course then you also need a person with a certain special qualities. It doesn't mean that the Buddha before his awakening he was special, he was just a human being, but obviously he had certain very powerful qualities to enable him to do that. Just like, you know, to become, to become like a, a super duper sportsman in the present time, like you know, a sprinter, Hussein Bolt, or whatever his name is. Uh, it's amazing what monks know, isn't it? We monks for 20 years, they know about these things. Uh, it's almost slightly embarrassing. Yeah, but uh, you, you live in the world, so you hear about these things. Uh, so, ha ha not everybody can become Hussein Bolt. Uh, why not? Because he has a special physique, he has a special mental abilities uh, that enable him to run so fast. Uh, in exactly the same way, a Buddha is an even rarer manifestation in the world uh, because it takes exceptional qualities coming together to enable you to do that. Uh, and when all of these factors come together, then there is something happens. Somebody is able to break through to reality. This natural phenomenon called a Buddha arises in the world as a consequence of that. Uh, and so this is what a Buddha is. Uh, yeah? He's just an ordinary person in many ways. Uh, yeah? So we need to remember that. Uh, there's nothing, uh, you know, we are also basically have the same qualities as us, yeah? except that, uh, you know, uh, we have perhaps not developed our qualities to uh, quite the same extent, uh, but basically we are the same as the Buddha. And what is also very interesting about this, because it is a natural phenomenon that arises every now and again, uh, it means that there is not just one Buddha. There are Buddhas also in the past. There will be more Buddhas in the future. Now. Yeah, if it is a natural phenomenon, it must arise every now and again. The conditions being right, uh, there will be more Buddhas. Uh, there have been Buddhas in the past. Uh. Why is that significant? Well, one of the reasons why that is significant, it is not significant because you should now chill and wait for the next Buddha. Yeah, That is not why it is significant. Uh. You know, people say this, you know, they say, oh yeah, my Treya is going to come soon, yeah. Now I, if I, can just, I can just relax for a few lifetimes and take it easy, and when my Treya comes, 
then I will put in the effort, yeah? I get a really good teacher to look after me, no more messing around with these kind of arahants. Arahants, not good enough, I want a real Buddha to be my teacher. Yeah? <laughs> and of course, the reality is it doesn't work like that, because if you, if you think that that is going to happen, and, yeah, you don't, you don't develop yourself in this life, uh, then uh, Maitreya comes around, you don't even, you're not even able to recognize Maitreya, yeah, because you are so deluded already that you don't know who, who this Maitreya is. Uh, and uh, so, moreover, you have no idea when the next Buddha will arise. You don't know if you will be around. Yeah, if the Buddha, next Buddha might arise in a country like India, and then you get reborn in a country like Norway. Yeah, Norway's not way from India, especially if there's no maybe it's kind of simple time. There's no planes around it. In Norway, they believe in Odin and Thor. Yeah, it's a kind of a big gap between Odin and Thor and Buddhism. So. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about Odin or Thor, of course, being Norwegian, but you know, still, there's a gap there. So, <laughs> so <laughs> but you know what I mean, yeah? So it, it's actually very dangerous. Not only is it dangerous, but it is a kind of disrespect to our present Buddha, that we, instead of focusing on his teaching and being grateful for what he has given us, yeah, over these last two and a half centuries, instead of being grateful for that, we focus on the future, on some other high in the sky Buddha, which may actually may or may not come. We don't know when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, whether we will be around or not. So this is the wrong way of thinking about things. And yet, if you look around the Buddhist world, there are so much of this kind of thing going on. Building whole monasteries just to for you know for the uh, to Maitreya Buddha, building massive stupas to kind of worship Maitreya Buddha in the future. Something we don't know anything about. Uh, and really, I think it is disrespectful to our present Buddha when we do that. Uh, so this is the wrong way of thinking about it. The, the right way of thinking about it, this is what I like about this idea, is that uh, if there are Buddhas in the past, uh, if there are more Buddhas in the future, if this is a natural phenomenon that arises every now and again, uh, what it means is that our period at this time is not special. Yeah, in a lot of religion is this idea that yeah, you are so lucky, you have been born in a special time, a special period, when this is available. Yeah. And I always thought that sounds a bit suspect, yeah? yeah. Okay, you are so lucky, you I mean, you were born in a Norway as a Christian country, you were so lucky you were Norway because it's a Christian country, yeah, so now you have a chance to be a Christian. It, it, all those people, you know, in you know Papua New Guinea or whatever, yeah, they don't have a chance. You know, they are lost already because they never hear about Christianity. Yeah. Kind of doesn't make any sense. So, and this is, I think, one of those beautiful aspects again about the Buddhist teaching is this universality. We don't live at a special time. We are not special people. We are just ordinary people like everyone else. Isn't that much better rather than believing that somehow you are special and you are unique and you are blessed by having been born at the right time? There's something suspect about that. But there's something very nice. If we are part of just a universal cycle that kind of always comes back and it goes in waves back and forth, that kind of, to me, is a far more, uh, far more rational and far more sensible outlook on how the world actually operates and how it functions. So every now and again, uh, you have this uh, uh, Buddha arising in the world, uh, and this is what this is all referring to. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> there you are. I'm going to have to stop there because already the hour has disappeared. Uh, I'm already behind schedule. It's amazing. Uh, I'm already kind of going much slower than I thought I would. This always happens when I do this repeat. So anyway. Um, I'm going to stop there then. and uh, this evening uh, we're going to have a, a session with Q&A so if you have any questions about anything that I talk about or what anything I don't talk about uh, please write it down on the outside of the room over there uh, and then we'll talk about it this evening. Uh, so you can basically ask about anything. Uh, I tend to be very liberal about these things and uh, you don't have to be shy if <coughs> you're going to offend me. I'm not that easily offended. Uh, yeah, it's true. I'm not just making it up. And if I really think the question is inappropriate, I will just say so. It's not going to be anything bad. But you're going to have to be pretty offensive to be inappropriate. Yeah? <laughs> but basically, you are OK. So please don't be afraid of asking questions. It is important to be able to have this openness of discussion that you can kind of get things off your chest and you can kind of get this understanding that is required to make progress on the path. 
in the meantime, uh, keep on enjoying yourself uh, and uh, just uh, enjoy the beautiful place, the beautiful weather, have a nice cup of tea or whatever later on, uh, and I will see you again uh, this evening. Uh, if you want to come for the meditation at 7 o'clock, uh, and then the Q&A at 8, or something like that, I can't remember the exact schedule. Okay, so that's it for now.